Hello and welcome to a hopefully quick lesson on some of the changes that happened to the common body of knowledge in May 2021. This video is intended for those of you who've been studying since before May of this year and are about to take the exam sometime soon. I'll cover the domain one changes in this video and hope to get to the other domains very soon. So let's start off with the definition or the new definition of risk. Risk is defined as an event that has a negative impact. An example would be a breach or a DDoS attack. Basically, ISC squared defines risk now as an event rather than a measurement. As you can see here, the old definition of risk was the likelihood of something bad happening. And it's important to know this definition, at least in my opinion, because it's the definition that makes more sense. And honestly, we don't know how strict they're gonna be with their definitions. So you could see this on the exam, you might see this on the exam. One other definition they added is for hazard, which is basically a natural disaster like an earthquake or a tornado. Now let's look at risk perspectives, which is a new subtopic that appeared in domain one. We have asset-based, outcomes-based, process-based, vulnerability-based, and threat-based. So asset-based is identifying risks based on what can happen to your assets. So like your data center or your data. Outcomes-based is identifying what can happen to your desired outcomes, such as profits, income, or sales. Process-based is kind of a weird one, but they talk about safety outcomes. There's literally less than one sentence on this, so don't fret if you don't understand it. From what I can tell, it's alluding to what safety-related outcomes can happen with differing changes, uh, with differences or changes to processes. I think outcomes and process-based are, are intertwined or related or conflated or something like that. Vulnerability-based is centered around inherent weaknesses and threat-based revolves around who can perform the attacks and who will perform the attacks. So for example, vulnerability-based would be you know, focusing your risk efforts on the open window or the unlocked window and a threat-based would be focused on, well, who is actually coming into our window. Next, we dive into a small change to the risk choices available to management. They basically only added a precursory step of prioritizing the risk before choosing one of the four options. And when they say prioritize, they mean in terms of safety. So see, there's just that one little step there. You're supposed to prioritize it in terms of safety before choosing one of the four options. So which of the risks in your organization will have an impact on human safety. And that's the one we take care of first. And then we decide how to take care of it by choosing one of the four, which you should already be familiar with these four. So I'm not gonna cover them in this video. Okay, so some new concepts related to risk evaluations. With qualitative, they're basically saying that everyone tries to use numbers and to not do that unless you're using something called FAIR, which provides a way for you to start and stay quantitative even if the risk itself begs for a qualitative approach. It talks about simulation, which is a way to get numbers and samples in order to be quantitative. Uh, some examples would be doing penetration tests, uh, desk checks, fuzz tests, and walkthroughs are just a few examples. All right, moving on to some new topics related to due diligence and due care. We have prudent and reasonable actions. So, a prudent action here is basically actions that most people like you and I or people like you in a similar life circumstance would do. So for example, the speed limit is 55, but in a court of law, you might be able to argue that most prudent people don't eyeball their speed limit all the time and are usually within five to 10 miles over or under the speed limit. I don't know if that's a great example, but there it is. Uh, reasonable actions are decisions that have logical justification. So for example, if you break someone's rib during a karate class, it's probably reasonably justified. But if you do that to a random person on the street, it's probably not going to hold up as reasonable in court. Okay, so a fairly big change with training and awareness. It's not the order of the acronym. It used to be SATE, but now it's SETA, CETA, however you want to say it. It's not that, but um, Security education, training, and awareness. It's the same thing, they just rearranged it. Education refers to increasing your knowledge and understanding. So if you want a mnemonic for this, so this is gonna be kind of a little bit of a change. So you might need to memorize this, I don't know. Education is edification. 
training, it focuses on improving your skills and proficiency with certain tasks. So it's very task focused, your skills, your proficiency. So education, edification, training tasks. And then we have awareness, which is how well acquainted someone is with education and the training needed. So how aware are the employees? Okay, so the, the big change here comes in how they've tossed away the idea of, they've gotten rid of the idea of, or any notion of formality in any of this stuff. Before they were saying that education is formal and training is semi-formal and awareness is informal. Well, all that's gone now, so you don't have to worry about that. You just have to know what education, training, and awareness mean. So one of the, one of the things that's comically new is this gamification. And I say comically because there's literally one sentence in the materials that I got from ISC Squared. So gamification basically refers to adding games to your education and training modules. An example would be like one of the matching questions that you might get on the exam, but with images instead of words, and you get a score for it or something like that, and some graphics that congratulate you at the end if you get them all right, or like something where you drag red flags over the text in a phishing, a fake phishing email, and then you might get points security champion it was actually missing from the common body of knowledge from the materials that i got from isc squared but it was in their exam outline that they published back in april and thankfully i know from experience that this security champion is basically a way of publicly recognizing someone for their superior knowledge or practice of security principles so this might be something that you see in large organizations such as nonprofit or government where if someone if someone prevents a breach or discovers and prevents fraud, for example, they might be rewarded with gift cards or extra vacation time. Maybe they have their names added to the internet or newswire or newspaper, the internal newspaper or something like that. All right, moving along. How do we evaluate our training materials, training and education and awareness materials? So we have, I believe these two things are basically the same. We have periodic content review which are basically where an employee looks at what needs to be updated and whether or not anything is irrelevant in the training and awareness. So for example, the laws that are cited, whether or not the links are still relevant, whether or not the topics like phishing emails are relevant. Right now, phishing emails are, are very relevant. So reviewing the content for that and then effectiveness evaluation is where you would test the effectiveness of the materials. And to do this, you start with the outcome such as employees being able to identify and report the phishing emails, right? That's your desired outcome. Due diligence is mentioned in this module in the context that when you evaluate, you've done your due diligence. So when you're doing this evaluation, you're doing your due diligence or the periodic content review, you're doing due diligence. And when you're, when you provide the training to your employees, you're providing, you're acting under due care. You're doing due care activities when you're actually doing the training. And remember that diligence is the legwork and care is the action. It's just a simple way of remembering it. Uh, thanks to Kelly Handerhan from Cybrary for that. She calls it the action or the research and then the action. So very simple way of remembering the differentiation between diligence and care. Moving on to non-disclosure agreements, we have all the various other names listed here because we know that ISC squared loves to use thesaurus terms in the exam. So whenever your book mentions these AKA terms, pay close attention and learn them well if you can. So we have confidentiality, confidentiality agreements, also uh, confidentiality disclosure agreements, proprietary information agreements, or secrecy agreements. So in the category of NDAs, we have unilateral, this is basically a one-way disclosure, meaning that one company is disclosing something, maybe a flat file that's sent to another organization for processing its downstream products. Bilateral is two-sided. So for example, we send you a flat file, you match it to your database, add stuff to it, send it back, and everyone's happy. Uh, multilateral just refers to three or more parties in the agreement. And a non-compete agreement, this basically is an agreement where the subject party says we won't use your stuff to become your competition like your secret sauce or your secret recipe or your formulas or blueprints etc moving on to the gdpr privacy tenants these are a bit different than the general privacy tenants which haven't changed so in order to not confuse them i've come up with a really lame but memorable mnemonic for you all so here it goes public displays of affection sure interest all of us 
I mean, this isn't true. Most of us look away when we see people kissing in public or whatever, but this will hopefully help us to remember the following tenets, which are basically the same with some small differences and changes in the wording and et cetera, et cetera. But the principles are all still there. So we have purpose limitation. The keyword is collected here. The data can only be collected for the stated purpose. With data minimization, the keyword is used because so they've separated out collected and used. Okay, different. Uh, you have to do it for the stated purpose. So you collect it and then you have to use it for the stated purpose. Accuracy is the same. It's just the method for, um, for the data subject to make corrections to make sure it's accurate. Storage limitation is the same as retention, meaning don't keep it longer than needed. Integrity and confidentiality means that you should make sure that there are no unauthorized modifications or viewing of the data. Accountability means that the owner or controller needs to be able to demonstrate that they're compliant. The last thing is a very minor change. Uh, this is where they call public domain, public chapter. I have no idea why I've never heard this term, but hey, I don't make the rules. It's ISC squared. It's their framework. It's their certification. Anyway, I hope this video has been helpful for everyone. We've finally updated our site to include questions and lessons on the new content. So please head over and check it out. I appreciate everyone who has supported the site thus far. This has been a very interesting project to say the least. Um, I won't keep you all. Have a great day and best of luck in your studies.